Spanish Webinar Wednesday Good afternoon from Washington, D.C., and welcome to Shaping the Way We Teach English Webinar Course 12, brought to you by the American English Team. Welcome back to all of our teachers who have joined us in many webinars before, and welcome to anyone who is joining us for the first time. Today is our fifth out of six webinars in Course 12. Today's webinar is There's an Elephant in My Lesson, and the last session of Course 12 will be in two weeks. Don't put your phone away. So we're excited to have that session coming up. Uh, the way you can participate in webinars is by using the chat box. So you can ask questions to your presenter, uh, discuss the topics with your colleagues around the world. Um, you will hear but not see the presenter. And you'll be able to follow along by listening to the presenter as well as reading the caption pod. Many of you know that e-certificates are issued for participants that attend at least four out of six webinars. In order to ensure you are eligible for the e-certificate, please remember to submit your email address at the very end of the webinar when we request it. And if you are hosting a viewing session, then please also include the number of participants. We hope that most of you are members of our Ning site. This is where you can access pre-readings and resources related to each topic. After the webinar, you can access recording, the PowerPoint presentation, and you can continue the discussion about each topic. Other ways to access our content is to download our mobile app, like us on Facebook to stay up to date with what's new, and you can also follow our YouTube channel that will also host all of our webinars. So please do visit our website at AmericanEnglish.state.gov to access many additional resources related to English teaching and learning. As you know, today's topic is very exciting. It's entitled, There's an Elephant in My Lesson, Animal Conservationism in the Classroom. And this webinar will showcase activities on the subject of animal conservationism and also encourage teachers to teach about things that they are passionate about. Kevin McCoy and Micah Risher are our presenters today, as well as animal lovers. And they believe that teachers succeed most when they incorporate themes into the classroom about which they are passionate. So we're so, so excited to have Kevin and Micah here today. And we'll get started. All right, thanks, moderator Jenny. Thank you, Moderator Jenny. We are stunned by their beauty. And so invite them to tell our stories. We will travel far just for a sight of them. We see ourselves in the way they behave. Sometimes we dress them up like us. But more often we dress like them. Because we envy their powers. As well as their creations. We name our sports teams for them. And even our brands after them. Sometimes we hardly even notice them. While other times the most common of animals make our surroundings richer and less common animals make our world more mysterious. So, what will it be like when they are gone? Welcome again, everyone. I'm Kevin McCoy. And I'm Micah Risher. And our webinar today, as Jenny has said, is there's an elephant in my classroom, in my lesson, Animal conservationism in the classroom. Micah, what is conservationism? Well, conservationism to me is when you look at the environment and the creatures that live within it and you aim to protect them. That's it. Very nice definition, Micah. It's protection of wildlife, support of wildlife. 
And there's our elephant in the room. You see a big elephant in the room and nobody's looking at him. This is a con this is a fairly common idiom, is that Micah? That's right, Kevin. So an elephant in the room is either an issue or um, a situation that everybody knows about, and it can be rather uncomfortable or awkward, and nobody really wants to talk about it, but <laughs> everybody knows about it. It would be hard not to notice that big elephant right there. Um, and figuratively, it's that thing that you don't want to talk about. Literally, we are going to be talking about elephants today. And the plight of animals, the struggle of species of wildlife, is something we know about, but we tend to ignore. In a way, it's an elephant in the room. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And you're going to be actively involved in uh, tasks on this very subject. And here are some of the things we hope to accomplish in this webinar. So the first one, we'd like to start by increasing awareness about the plight of some animals and build on that. And to do so, we're going to provide you with lots of activities that you can take right into your classroom. And we'll also show you how to break into the syllabus, because as we all know, sometimes this is the most important factor. How do we take the activities and use them? Yeah, you might not have time in your lesson, but we're going to make a case for breaking into the syllabus and providing time for the things you love. Which leads me to point number four. We hope to inspire you to, to bring your passions to the classroom, whatever they are. If it's animals and wildlife, that's great, but it might be something else. We're also going to play a little game. Ooh, we love games. Yes, we do. That is our secret elephant. It's a white elephant, a silhouette, a white silhouette, and you will see him appear somewhere in this webinar. We won't tell you where. I believe he'll appear once, but he might appear more. But Kevin, what do folks do if they see the white elephant? Ah, excellent question. This is especially for those of you in viewing sessions. When you see the white elephant, we want you to jump up and shout, secret elephant. Even if you're at home watching on your computer, it's a good idea to jump up and shout, secret elephant. Your family will understand. They will. It will be fun. Now, the secret elephant is not going to be that big. It's going to look more like this. I see an ant. That's right. The secret elephant is never very obvious. Oh, Shaman from Iraq has seen it. Good job, Shaman. So you can see, your eye is drawn to the ant because there's a big red arrow pointing at it. But the secret elephant is hovering down near the American English sign. So he won't be too obvious. All right, we've got a lot of LOLs out there. LOL. Is that someone's name? <laughs> OK, thank you, LOL. <laughs> uh, and we're going to move on now. Please have a pen and paper ready. I know this is a webinar, but we like the old tools of the trade. And sometimes we're going to ask you to write something down on a piece of paper rather than type it in the chat box. Because if you type a short answer in the chat box, we can't see it. It just goes too fast. So let's begin. Oh, but first. Yeah, please, whatever you do, don't freak out. <laughs> we're going to learn from our little friend here. He's freaking out because Kevin appears to be um, intimidating him. So we don't want to intimidate you. So just have fun with this. Garcia asks, what is that? That's an eye eye. It's a small marsupial from the forests of Madagascar, only in the north. It's an endangered animal. But all of these activities that you're going to see and play with Micah and me today are available on our knee. And if you're watching this in the future, or on YouTube, they will be available at American English. 
Let's begin with a quiz. We first like to array, raise awareness about animals, and we're going to do this in a very simple way, and that is a quiz. Do you have a pen and paper ready? We're going to show you seven animals, and we would just like you to write the name down. Let's try the first one as an example. Let's try the first one. Don't type the answer in the chat box because it's quite easy and we don't need to see a hundred answers in the chat box. All right, let's try that first one. Hmm. That appears to be a... It's not a lion. Aha. It's a... What is that? It's a cat. Right you are, Michael. Micah. I didn't ask him to spell it because I didn't want to make things too difficult. Um, but Kevin, this is really easy. Let's we'll step it up a notch. All right, we're going to step it up a notch. There are seven animals, and as we get closer towards number seven, they will be more difficult. Write down on your piece of paper and not in the chat box, please, the next animals. And the quiz will begin when you hear the sound. Kelsey, do you know what this is? I don't know. Is that an ostrich? Yeah. We're testing Kelsey, who's in the room with us right now. How about that? That one looks like you, Kevin. <laughs> the one in front? <clears throat> that appears to be a cobra. That's a cobra in the back. Don't worry about the guy in front. That's just a little friend of mine who travels with me. And number seven, you know what this is? I might be wrong, but is that a lemur? Wow, that Kelsey, is. that's a lemur again from Madagascar. Raise your hand if we have any uh, participants from Madagascar here. Okay, we don't. All right, how did you do in the quiz? I'm hoping that. Okay, we've got a couple. Oh, I see them from Madagascar. Maybe welcome. So I hope you did well on that first quiz, getting uh, at least six of seven. And <clears throat> a key word we'd like to introduce now is habitat, the natural home or environment of an animal. And Michael, let's do a super simple activity to get beginning students aware of habitat, where an animal lives. Sounds good. So. You'll see as an example that cats live, for example, in people's homes. Do they live anywhere else, Kevin? Yes, I think cats live on the street sometimes. That's right. So your answers may vary, but obviously the question is, where do cats live? So the next question, where do giraffes live? Kevin? Uh, giraffes live in Africa would be my answer. In someone's apartment in Africa? No, they live in the veld or uh, in the savanna. Okay, just checking. How would you answer that? I mean, how would you complete the sentence? Maybe giraffes live, um, they're known to live in parts of Africa where they have access to trees. Alberto says in the lakes. Luis says in the zoo. Well, that's possible. Actually, many answers are possible here. And are we looking for something that has to be one correct answer? No. In fact, the more answers are possible, the more students produce the language, right? That's right. And that's good. How would we do this activity with a whole class if you had 40 people in the class? You might start by pair work. The students get together with their neighbor and interview each other after first writing down. They might come up with three of their own animals that the teacher doesn't even know about, and then they swap after they've had a chance to compare. Right. So students could write these sentences themselves. The teacher could write them on the board to get students started. Very simple activity for beginners. But this, 
the unfinished sentence provides a little bit of support to get them started. Now we're going to use a grid which also supplies students with support. Well, let's give an example. Um, so I'm going to choose an orangutan. I happened to have the chance to go to Borneo a long time ago. Borneo is where orangutans usually live. Borneo is an island that is shared by Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei. And orangutans live among the trees. Orangutans eat vegetation and... Mm, yum, I love vegetation. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And orangutans are m probably most famous for their wild orangish-reddish hair. And they're the hairiest among the primates. Wow, yeah. I'm sort of known for my wild orange hair at times, too. We often confuse you for an orangutan. Oh, no one has told me that before. Uh, That's a compliment to you. Oh, is it? Thank you. All right, let me try one, too. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use beaver here. And using the support of the chart, I will say a beaver lives in or near the water. I think they make dens, actually, inside the water. Beaver eats, uh, I think they eat vegetation. <laughs> and insects. And insects, do Sometimes. they? Okay, thank you. And, and the beaver is famous for his tail or building a dam, I would say. Right. Anything else to add? And their big teeth. Oh, and big teeth, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Mike and I are using this to support speaking, but we could also have... Um, students write in this, couldn't we? Yeah, they could, and they could also modify this. They could add columns if they wanted to. <gasps> I love modification almost as much as I like vegetation. So here's an example. The first column is animals. It, they, it might be a good idea to start with the animals that actually live in your country or region of the country. And you can also change the other columns. What would be an example of changing another column, Kevin? Okay. Uh, instead of lives, for example, I could write the word color. Oh, and, that's right. And then next to rhino, for example, color, I would write gray. OK. Another one might be, are they nocturnal? Do they, are they awake at night? Or how many legs do they have? Uh-huh, that's a good one. OK. Do they have a? Um, a horn. <laughs> Not many animals do, okay. Uh, but the point is we could change those columns, and certainly students could choose the animals that they want to describe, right? In fact, that's a great suggestion. So what we like about this uh, grid and chart is that it supports language, and it's also very easy to change and accommodate to your students' needs. And this is available on the huge handy animal handout, as are all the activities in this webinar. You can download that from the name. What have we here? So these are jazz chants. This is an example. Um, the animal everybody can see is a giraffe. And there are actually. 19 of these that we have available for you. This is but one. And what are we going to do with this? Well, a jazz chant um, is like a poem. We happen to have a recording of this. It's a very rhythmic poem. It's excellent for students to listen or to practice rhythm, the sounds of English language. I have an idea. I like it. <laughs> Maybe not after you hear it. Why don't we listen to this? And while all of you are listening, pay particular attention to the rhythm and intonation and how you respond to it. Does it is, do you think it's easy? Do you think it's difficult? Do you enjoy it? Pay attention to that. Well, Angelique in Suriname says, let the kids write one. Huh, good idea, Angelique. You're, you're ahead of us. You are ahead of us. Let's listen now to Giraffes Are Strong by... Number 8. 
Giraffes are strong. Giraffes are tall. Their tails are short. Their necks are long. Giraffes are strong. Giraffes are fast. Their legs are long. Their horns are short. Giraffes are strong. Giraffes are quiet. They never make noise. They never, never, never eat girls or boys. So, what did you notice? It seems like everybody out there in webinar land loves this. Fantastic song for children. Okay, so Graciela from Mexico has pointed out that it's very easy. That's one of the points here. It's it's easy. So our task for you is simply to to listen and, and note down how you respond to it. But what else could teachers be doing? Well, what I like to do is have students repeat this to the rhythm, giraffe, saw, tall, and some movement. For example, when they say that, they would stand up very tall, maybe stretching their hands up in the air. That's a great idea. I've, I've seen in different parts of the world, where I'll have groups of teachers actually get in small circles. If you have a large classroom, you can still do this. You just have many small circles and have the students walk to the rhythm in that circle, mimicking the movements of the giraffe or whatever the jazz chant may be. Lots of people say good for beginners, for kids. Uh, Valeria from Brazil says I would use it with adults too. I certainly would. I like that attitude. I would too. If you had fun with this, chances are your students are going to have fun and other adults will too. Absolutely. Plus, it, it's an investment of five minutes of class time. That's well worth it. Besides, I think we can do wonderful things with this format. And here's one which we like to call a writing frame. So going back to the idea of having students come up with their own, well, here's an example. Yes, someone was it suggested students can write their own. Um, and this is a, a support mechanism. You see that Mike and I are big on, big on offering support, language support. You'll see on the right, I have removed the word giraffes with a blank. So now we could put in the name of an animal and make our own poem based on this. Now, I'm going to put Micah on the spot and ask him to make up his own poem. Can okay. you do that? I'll give it my best effort. I might need your help. But let's try it. OK, so I'll go for monkeys. OK. Monkeys are small. Monkeys are small. Their arms are long. Mm -hmm. Their brains are big. Wow. Monkeys are smart. Let's okay. try to set that to, to some music or a pattern. OK. Monkeys, Monkeys are, are small. small. Their, Their arms are long. Their, Their brains are big. Monkeys are smart. Monkeys are smart. <laughs> Monkeys are smart, and so are you. Oh, sorry, we improvised a little. Uh, but you see how easy it is to create a jazz chant, which gives students the rhythm and the uh, stress of English, of natural English language. Um, and I planned ahead, unlike Micah, and wrote my own Jazz chant. It is cheating. I'll allow it. But that's the kind of guy I am. And I'm going to set mine to, to music here. Whales are mammals. Their bodies are big. Their lungs are huge. Whales are fish. Whales are fish. Kevin, that's fabulous. Thank you. But I have a question. Yes. So the last line, it says, whales aren't fish, but you didn't follow the format. Why is that? 
I know. I didn't follow the format of the writing frame. That's cheating, isn't it? Uh, well, well, I don't think so. I think really? I think it was good that you did that. Yes. Why is it good? Well, what's the point here? Is it to memorize something and have it fit into a form, or is it to play with the language and learn from it? I think it's to support the language, play with it. If they're playing with the language, that's great. We want learners to take risks. Azar from Pakistan, thanks for sharing. Sharks are beautiful. Their the teeth, teeth are sharp. sharp. Their, Their fins, fins are perfect. perfect. Sharks are beautiful. Wow, so people are writing chants even now. Good work, everybody. Yeah, so keep in mind that a writing frame is to provide support. It's not a rule by which we handcuff students or limit them. That was fun. Now you can see we like to use charts and grids and visual aids because they provide support for students and make it easier to talk about these topics. Here's one that asks us how we feel about these animals. Now your students could put their own animals in the column on the left, but we have at random thrown some animals in there, and I haven't misspelled the word baboon. Please forgive me. That's OK. okay. You can have your students correct it. <laughs> so yeah, good idea. Um, Shall we take a look? Yeah. How would you use this? You want to give us an example? OK, so well, first, let's look what's already done. Uh, with the mosquito, you know, it's they're, everybody's probably familiar with mosquito, and most people probably think they're disgusting or creepy. Um, it's interesting, because we hate them so much, but they love us. This is the do. They always want to be with me. <laughs> That's because you're very sweet. <laughs> so I want to go for snake. So I think a snake is both beautiful and scary. Mm. I think it's beautiful because they're so clean. You never see a dirty snake. They take care of themselves. And they have a lot of interesting patterns. However, they're very scary to me. I, I wouldn't want to come across one. Um, so in the other category, I would say I have deep regard for snakes. It doesn't mean I want one as a pet. Um, but I like to keep my distance. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I just want to jump in here and say Fabio Ramirez says, and this is helpful to know more about our students. Excellent point. I think that's really important. You'll notice that these activities we've designed are not about repeating facts. They're about how do you feel. They're about activating students' background knowledge of animals. Not just memorization, but expressing how they feel. Yeah, and some people are commenting that you can, you can do this for hobbies. That's absolutely right. You can find out so much just from providing this language support. Yeah. So what would you do? Would you write this on the board, give it to each student in a handout? Or what, well, how would you use this? If there was material available, I'd want my students to come up with their own chart and add their own categories. Yeah. I would like them to write, draw in their own x's here. So could you add uh, a column to this? Would you change anything? Sure, you could add or take away columns. You could put in some blank columns so that students would have to, could uh, put in the topic. What would you add to this? Perhaps, uh, do I relate to the animal? Or um, is this animal misunderstood? Or? That's, that's what comes to mind right now. Yeah, is this animal misunderstood? That's very good, because I can see, um, is this animal appreciated? That's another good one. Because I can see some worm, snake, mouse, vulture that probably are not appreciated. Hyena, too. I bet vultures appreciate vultures. Here we Lions. <laughs> I think vultures appreciate everybody, as long as they're not living. <laughs> um, Natalia from Kyrgyzstan says, one table and all students work on this. Yeah, as group work. Or it can be, and then compare. 
Great suggestion, Natalia. We can have the class compare and even compile information on how the whole class feels, a sort of study. OK. Great idea for spicing up conversation, says Hernando. And someone, Ricardo has asked, would you like this animal as a pet in your house? Great. This is better than my chart. Yeah, good job, everyone. Um, Fabiola asks characteristics. Students could write quite a bit under that column, description. All right, excellent uh, suggestions, everyone. Thank you. And guess what time it is? It's time for quiz number two. All right. How is this quiz going to be different than number one, Micah? I imagine it's going to be somewhat harder. It's not going to be quite as easy. And we're going to ask you to be more specific. And again, please write this down for yourself. And we'll provide, we're going to go through this fairly quickly. And then afterwards, we can share our thoughts in the chat box. Yeah. So we'll show you all seven pictures. You don't need to write the answers in the chat box. Write them on a piece of paper. And we'd like you to be more specific. What do I mean? Here's an example. We saw that animal in quiz number one. It's a rhino. But what kind of rhino is it specifically? Uh-huh. So we're going to be a little bit more difficult. Here we go with the quiz. All seven animals. Are you ready? There we go. I hope you wrote down all seven. I hope you wrote down all the animals. <clears throat> and we're going to show you the answers now. And we'll see how well you did. Take a look. Did anybody get all seven? Just five, Marla, from Mexico. That's good. Anybody get zero? Graciela missed the last one. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I got one. Oh. One is good. This webinar is all about learning more. Yeah. So it's not about being right or wrong here. It's about learning. Yeah. Actually, we're just trying to introduce the topic, uh, introduce you to some new animals. So it doesn't matter how many you got. If you notice the theme, in these animals at all. Here's a hint. Hmm, what do these letters mean? Does anyone have any idea? Each letter is an abbreviation for something. Louisa from Mexico says endangered species. Hmm. Absolutely right. Hmm. So here we have a chart that illustrates a spectrum of where animals are considered and they're being in danger or not. So on the far left, we have extinct, meaning they're no longer with us. And on the right, we have least concern, meaning that the, peop the scientists who watch this aren't terribly concerned that their population is at risk. But what about the other symbols? Any guess on what they could mean? What could EW mean? CR. And this is something you could try with an advanced class. Put these on the, on the board and see if they can guess. Renato has already guessed CR. It means critical. Let's check it out. Let's check it out. So on the far left, you have extinct. That animal no longer exists. And then you have EW, extinct in the wild. What does that mean? Well, for example, they might be in a zoo or in some kind of captivity, but their population is so small that 
they're in captivity to protect them. That's right. Some have had their habitat destroyed, so the only way they can survive is people taking care of them. All right, so you'll see that this is a continuum starting from least concern all the way to extinct. And these are key words that are worth introducing to students. So let's take a look at each of these animals. So the first one, again, is the western black rhino. And you noticed in the chart that it's extinct. It's no longer with us. It was declared extinct in 2011. But here's a question for you. How many do you think were around in 1900? About 100 years ago. 100 years ago, how many of these were there? <laughs> well, there were about 1 million. So in a little over 100 years, the population was reduced to zero. 1 million to zero. That's a sad story. Rhinos are hunted for their horns. And here's a picture that Kevin took at one of the airports we have in Washington, D.C. It's a campaign to raise awareness um, so that people can shop responsibly and make sure they're not buying anything that's coming from a rhinoceros. The rhinoceros is killed for its horn, but it has no medicinal value. It's all myth. Um, science finds no medicinal value in the rhino horn. But still, the prices for it are high. This is the golden toad. This was only discovered in 1976, high up in a rainforest in Costa Rica. Only discovered in 1976, and guess what? 30 years later, the beginning of this century, it became extinct due to loss of habitat. It lived in a very small area. And these guys swimming around are bluefin tuna. Now you'll notice they're not extinct. They're still with us, but they are endangered. Why are they endangered? Well, because of overfishing. You can sell a single fish for up to 30,000 US dollars. It might make someone happy, but it certainly doesn't make the population of the bluefin tuna happy. So keep that in mind when you think about eating bluefin tuna. Yes. And here is the African forest elephant. It's a little bit smaller than those large elephants that you see in, on the savanna in Kenya or southern Africa. He lives in the forests of equatorial Africa. Now, between 2002 and 2011, 62 percent of these animals have been wiped out. Ivory hunters, illegal hunters, are killing them. And this cute little guy named the Baiji is, as you'll see, no longer with us. And when it was around, it was only found in the Yangtze River. And the last one known to be seen died in 2002. Oh, you recognize the tiger right away. I'm sure that I doubt anyone recognized this as the Caspian tiger. The last one was seen in about 1970. Um, and they lived in this range from the Mediterranean Sea all the way into China, you can see, and around the Caspian Sea. But alas, there are no more of them. And finally, we have these little guys that are also sadly extinct. Um, the thylacine, otherwise known as the Tasmanian tiger. They're were similar to dogs, but they're actually marsupials, and which means they had pouches on their stomachs where they could carry their kids. Isn't that amazing? He looks like a dog, he has tiger stripes, and he carries babies in a pouch like a kangaroo. And sadly, we can no longer see one. Yeah. You can watch a videotape if you want to see something really sad on YouTube of the last one walking around in his cage. 
But, Kevin, that sounds a little gloomy. We I shared know. a lot of sad statistics. Why don't, we, why don't we do something a bit more optimistic? You think we can? I know we can. All right, let's try. <sighs> okay, so first up, we have Yellowstone National Park. I drove past this a few summers ago, and it's definitely beautiful. So what's significant here? This is the first modern wildlife reserve ever created, and that was in 1872. And today, 150 years later, wildlife reserves cover 10% of the Earth's land surface. So we went from zero reserves to how many, uh, do you know the miles? I don't know the miles. I know that there are 44,000 wildlife reserves in the world today. So 44,000. That is significant. Phew, that makes me feel better. Going from zero wildlife reserves protecting wildlife to 44,000. And guess what? You might recognize that. Who is that? That's our African forest elephant. Well. I just told you about the tragedy of how 62% have been killed in the last 10, 12 years. How can this possibly be a hope story? Well, you see, there's the range of the African forest elephant's habitat in equatorial Africa. But let's zoom in to one country. Let's just test their geography right now. Who can tell me what country that is? Do we have anyone from this country? Starts with a G. Ghana, no. Germany. Let's give it to them. All right. That is Gabon. Now, why is this a hope story for the forest elephant? Because more than half of all surviving forest elephants are in Gabon. And that's because Gabon has made reserves where they protect these elephants. 11% of their country, in fact, has been dedicated to reserves. So there's one country where they're really fighting to protect these wonderful elephants. Gabon. Here we have the golden lion tamarind monkey. This cute little guy was thought to be extinct until the 1970s. But then, at that time, scientists found that there were 200 of them. And we already have a teacher who knows where. So yes, they are found in Brazil. So we went from 200 to now over 1,000 due to conservation efforts to protect them. That's a great story. When we make an effort, we can really help these guys. And here you'll notice the Caspian tiger again. How can this be a hope story? Because the Caspian tiger is gone. Well, the Amur tiger, who lives in northern China and uh, the Russian Far East, is very similar genetically. In fact, at one time, they were the same species and drifted apart, becoming a subspecies. But they're close enough that we could reintroduce the Caspian tiger into the habitat he formerly occupied. This is good news. And in fact, some countries are trying to do that and, indeed, to double the population of tigers in the world by 2022. Here we have whales. This particular whale is the humpback whale, but it shares the same story with gray whales and blue whales. All of these species have made a significant comeback after being devastated by whaling. There's more awareness around the world of, about the struggle of whale populations, and people's habits are changing. And so, thankfully, more whales are surviving. Yeah, we have many more whales than we did 100 years ago. All right, so I hope you feel a little bit better. But the reason these animals are rebounding is because people are making an effort. In this next stage, we're going to challenge our awareness a little bit more by challenging some of the assumptions that we make about animals. Who knows what this guy is? I have to say I'm quite proud to um, have taken that picture this myself. Is, uh, yeah, this is Kevin take a, taking a picture of himself in the mirror before he went to modeling school. 
how many uh, uh, animals are you going to compare me to today? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was in a shark cage with um, world famous moderator Jenny um, in South Africa two years ago. That is a great white shark. Isn't he handsome? Were you afraid? I was not afraid at all. I was way too dizzy and sick and cold to be afraid of anything. <laughs> uh, no, I wasn't afraid. They were magnificent. Um, so let's see how you feel about sharks. We're going to take two polls about sharks and get your opinions. Yes, Elsa, it's really true. And it's really true that moderator Jenny was there as well. All right, so do you like sharks? Not that you meet them on the street every day, but... And we're going to have a second poll about sharks as well. So about 51% of people think they like sharks. This is very good. Okay, well, what's the worst thing about sharks? They're just scary. They're dangerous to people. That's a very common perception. Yeah. And many say all of the above. Okay, are they dangerous to people? Certainly not. If you're not in the water. <laughs> they're not very dangerous. But we're going to tell you some really astounding shark facts. But first of all, okay, if we think sharks are dangerous, how many people worldwide die from shark attacks every year? What are your guesses? Some people saying few, some saying 10, 15, 20, 2, 100. I think the previous group gave you some answers. 7,000. You guys are, yeah, 1,000. No, you're just all very smart. Very few. You guys are right. I mean, you can think about accidents that people have, falling down on the street, falling in the bathtub. All those things are much more dangerous than sharks. Now, people do fish for sharks and eat sharks. So how many sharks do we kill every year? That's the next guess. How many sharks do people kill? kill. Any guesses? Uh, we got, wow, big number there, 100,000 or uh, 11, I don't know, but you guys are, you are on track. You are understanding the discrepancy. So actually 100 million sharks are killed by people every year. What's the, what's another breakdown per day? Well, per day, if you want oh, that. Oh, even per hour, wow. Yeah. So 11,000 sharks die every hour. Wow. That's staggering. Is it? No, it must be an hour. Yeah. Yeah, staggering. So people are fishing for sharks, but they're also fishing for other sharks, uh, other fish, and happen to catch sharks and just kill them because they don't like sharks. Horrendous, yeah. This is all interesting that we think sharks are dangerous because you don't think cars are very dangerous, right? You wouldn't want to outlaw cars, would you? Probably not. No, oh, they're convenient. However, more than a million people die in car accidents every year. Much more than a million. So compared to 11 people killed by sharks, we really could use some perspective on this. And this is an activity you could do with students in groups. Give them these questions and ask them to guess the answers. They don't need to know. You can give them the facts later. Does it have to be sharks? Oh, Fabiola and Maria, Maria. from Bolivia. People found the secret elephant there. Good job. So, Kevin, I have a, a question. Could, does it have to be sharks, or could you do this for other things? Actually, you could um, ask these questions about any animal, especially one that you think we, 
people have a misperception about. Mm -hmm. And once again, this activity is in the handout. And I just thought I'd put this reference in because this website, Nature, uh, it's actually a television show. And they also have, you can see here, a section for educators. So they have short videos with lessons for educators. And they happen to have several on sharks and why they are important to the ecosystem. OK. And for those of you who eat seafood, uh, it's nice to have this information about what people, what researchers have put together to determine what are some more uh, humane choices, the best choices, and also which types of seafood you might want to consider avoiding in order to help conserve the animal populations. Yeah. So those in the avoid column will be endangered or vulnerable species of fish. But where can people find this? You can find them everywhere. Lots of organizations post these on the internet. In fact, they have local ones. Is it just, so it's not just in English? No. You can find them anywhere. I just looked for one. I searched in Russian. And here's a, a guide for what to buy in Russian as well for seafood. So you can find these regionally and in different languages. Next, we're going to try some deep thinking, some critical thinking about our environment and our role in it. And to do this, we're going to read and listen to a bird parable. Micah, can you tell us what a parable is? Sure. To me, a parable is a short story with a clear message or moral. That's right. This is definitely a story with a, a message or moral. Actually, there's probably a lot of morals. And we're not going to tell you what they are. So we would like you to listen and read this story. And when you're reading, write down to yourself what you think the moral might be. Yeah. What is the moral of the king and the birds? There once was a king who did not like birds. He disliked them most of all in the spring, when they made such noise with their singing, cooing, chirping, and calling. So the king sent people carrying bags of gold to nearby countries to buy cats. Adjusting cats, please. Thousands and thousands of cats. And the people brought the cats back home. There, the cats hunted the birds, and hunted, and hunted. After a few weeks, the trees and the sky were silent, and the king thought, Ah, oh, now it is peaceful. But with the birds gone, new creatures arrive. Flies, mosquitoes, and all those little buzzing things that birds like to eat and that fly around people's heads. The creatures came by the millions and by the tens of millions, and with them came fleas. And the fleas jumped on the cats and bit them and made them yowl often at night. Now the king's country was noisier than it had ever been. Where have all the birds gone? The king thought, his head aching from the noise. Where are the birds? Okay, great. We've already got some morals before the end of the audio, even. Um, Think before you make a move from Zach. 
Good one. Mother Nature creates all animals for a reason. Is there anything else you can think of? Well, I agree with all those. I think everything is connected is a good one. I think don't be so arrogant and think you can change things. It's a message for kings and for regular people. We have Ricardo Davino from Zacatecas, Mexico, sharing a story about Panama, similar thing, but it led to crocodiles. Very interesting. Yeah, so wow. we all need to be mindful before we <laughs> decide we're going to change the order of things. Do not play with nature, says Pilar. And, uh, mm -hmm. Okay, great. So this activity comes from Forum Magazine. I'm sure that you are familiar with Forum. It's the brand new Forum issue. You can download this classroom activity section on the Ning. And there are follow-up activities for writing your own parable. And the audio is there as well. But this kind of activity requires students to think, what's the meaning of it? And that's why we wanted to do this with you. There are more follow-up activities on the subject of birds as well. But wait a second. Micah, we're giving them all sorts of activities. That's right. Maybe we should stop. No, 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 no. We're pausing because this is commonly what teachers will come up with. Well, this is all great and well, but we don't have time for these extra classes. Have you ever heard that before? All the time. And I understand it. In your situation, you might have a syllabus, and you must teach some every bit of it. You might have a course book that you have to do every activity in it. Some teachers don't have a lot of time. Let's figure out who has time and who doesn't. So we're going to take a poll. Do you have time to incorporate your own activities into the lesson? Wow, overwhelmingly. Oh, uh oh, we're dropping now <laughs> from 41. So more than half the people say they don't, or say a little. Good. Only 4% say the syllabus dictates how we spend time. Well, that's good. We think a lot of, we think teachers should feel independent enough to incorporate their own activities into the lesson. And the trick is, how do you do it? How do you break into the syllabus? Which is the subject of our next section. And there's also passion-based learning, which we'll address shortly. But first, why don't we take a look at what we mean by breaking into the syllabus? How? Well, usually the syllabus demands that you teach certain structures, grammar, or skills, reading, writing, speaking, listening, and thinking. So can we create our own structure activities and substitute them for things in the syllabus? Activities that we're passionate about. This looks like a game. It is a game. It's a guessing game. And we're going to show you this same game three times because it's adaptable and it can function to practice different structures. Let's try it. All right. So Mike is going to think of a secret creature, and he's going to describe it. OK. So this creature lives in the water. This creature eats small insects and plankton. This creature likes to swim upstream in rivers. Aha. Uh -huh. And this creature is usually multicolored. So we have 
Alicia from Suriname is saying fish. Other people are saying fish as well. Yeah, what kind of fish? Maria from Bolivia. All right, Maria, you're correct. It's a salmon. And Antonio from Peru. But yeah, it's a salmon. It's a salmon. Okay. So one person describes, and the rest of the group, I envision students doing this in small groups, guess. Now, we've got the same activity, but a different structure. Do you want to try this time? I do. Um, if I were this creature, I would live. Um, I would live in the desert. I would eat, I think, some kind of vegetation. I would like to walk. I don't know what else they do besides walk. Um, I would walk around the desert. Um, my colors would be tan or brown. And look at all the people are guessing. Indeed. It is a camel. All right. OK, so, and now look at this. We have the same activity and yet another new structure. Can you think of another animal to describe another right. secret creature? I'll try. OK, so if I had been this creature in a previous life, I would have lived above the forest or in the forest. Hmm. I would have eaten small creatures. I would have been afraid of giant creatures swiping me in the air. I would have I wouldn't have I wouldn't have flown near volcanoes. And I would have looked up for meteors that were coming to Earth. All right, Renato. You're correct. It's a pterodactyl. Wow. So Micah went uh, obscure. But that was an excellent description. And Jess from Mexico, you're correct. This is a dinosaur. So did you notice this, this could be used for animals that are extinct? Yeah, it can. And also, as we said before, these are models. Students don't have to follow them exactly. These are meant to support their language. They can use the model, or they can veer away from it. OK, so our point is, for breaking into the syllabus, often the requirement of the syllabus is to teach structures or skills. If we are teaching the skills that are required by the syllabus, but incorporating our own activities, who's to tell us we're not doing our job? Right. And we could even have the students suggest words to substitute in the syllabus or take that existing grammar structure and have the students come up with an activity to use it themselves. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why would we want to bring our own activities into the lesson or the syllabus? Well, so. There's a concept around now called passion-based classroom. And here are three of the sort of interesting takeaways from 25 ways to institute passion-based learning in the classroom. The first one is share your own passion with your students. Why is, why is that important, Kevin? I just think that when you really care about something, you're going to be a better teacher and spend more time on creating a better lesson. That's right. And the same is true of your students. If you let your students spend time articulating their passions, they're more likely to want to continue learning. Mm -hmm. And finally, it's important, and this is the difficult one, but it is important to set aside time for passions to flourish. Yeah. That is the difficult one, because often if we follow the syllabus or the cor course book, we do this, we do that, we do that. But sometimes you need to let these interests develop. Isn't that what learning is about, the developing of interests? Yeah, and motivating students to pursue those interests. Yeah. So there's a link to that article on the Ning if you'd like to read more. 
But basically, it boils down to this. When we just teach the facts, it's like filling a bucket. Education is not fill the filling of a bucket, but the lighting of a fire. Yeah, because if you think about it, what happens to that bucket when you fill it up? <laughs> is there no more learning? <laughs> There's nothing. You, you can't add more. Well, some of it will fall out. So we're, That's right. we're saying students aren't capable of learning more. Whereas if it's a fire, you don't know the end of it. And to me, that's sort of the goal of education is, is to get students to keep learning on their own as much as possible. Right. So how you and your students can help what can you do to help the environment and to help wildlife? Here's some of our suggestions. So the first one is be aware. Give opportunities for your students to be aware of the conditions of animals or whatever your passion is. That's where it all starts, building awareness. Mm -hmm. And in this webinar, we've started very gently, just by showing photographs and, and having small activity, like what is the habitat. But the, we can introduce more and more to build students' awareness. It's also important to cultivate students' care for their interests. It starts with awareness, and then it moves to caring. Students become aware of what they care about when you give them these opportunities. And if they care, they're more likely to have strong interests. But if you feel powerless, you're not likely to care. That's why we offer this idea. Dare to do the little things. There are many things that you and your students can do, and you can incorporate these into class or after class, to really have an impact on the environment. These are small things, but they are helpful. So a very easy one that we can all do is pick up trash when we see it. Why is that important? Well, well, you think, how does picking up trash help a rhinoceros or an elephant? Well, directly it doesn't. But you're thinking, we have to protect the environment around us. It's all some animal's habitat. And also, when you see other people picking up trash, you're probably more likely to be curious about what they're doing and why. And you may have just motivated other people to start caring about the environment around them. That's right. Besides, everything will look better if you clean it up. And maybe you can plant a tree near your school or in your home or in a community garden. And you might say, well, one tree's not going to make a difference. Well, don't stop with one tree. Maybe. Try to do a, a tree every year, something as simple as that. And after a few years, you have a collection. You have animals that have a space to hang out, and you can see what happens. That one tree might make a difference for a bird who's very tired. That's right. <laughs> OK. Or you can write a letter. Who can you write a letter to? Your friend, your mom, your government. Yeah. TV station, anybody. Just share the knowledge. And some people have said, well, the government won't care. That might be true, but if nobody writes a letter, that's certainly true. <laughs> yes. People need to know what their constituents want. So one way to do that is to speak your mind in the appropriate way. And nowadays with email, it's very easy to write a letter. It probably doesn't cost you anything. So those are some suggestions. But also here's one. Where? Where your curiosity. That means don't be afraid of being curious. Follow your curiosity and stay curious. How can you not be curious when we have fellows like this one? Wow, here's a tree pangolin. How can you not like him? As Kevin says, this, this guy certainly is cute. Yeah, he's from China and lives in trees. So now we're going to show you some animals that you probably don't know about at all. And hopefully, um, peak your curiosity. All right. <laughs> the giant coconut crab. 
this not so little guy, would he scare you or no? If I were walking down a dark alley at night and I saw that, I would turn around and run. <laughs> a shark wouldn't bother me, but that guy would scare me. Any idea where this can be found? Australia. I think it's somewhere in the South Seas. Uh, yeah. I want to know more now. It's from this world. Yeah. Well, see, look at, we have all these questions. We've piqued your curiosity. Go find out more about him. This is a Tarzir. He doesn't look like he's from this world either, does he? No, in fact, have any of you seen the film Star Wars? Does he remind you of any character? That's right, <laughs> Luisa Yoda. Yeah, I believe that he was that Yoda was patterned after this fellow. Yeah, he does look. He's from the Philippines, Southeast Asia. There's not very many of them around. They are also endangered. <sighs> what do we have here? It's actually a soft shell turtle. Uh, do you think you could beat this guy in a race on land? <laughs> I think I could beat him in a race, in, in a lot of things. But what about underwater? Not swimming. Yeah, it looks like he, he has some power. So that's a soft shell turtle. He's not been smashed. He's just got a very soft shell. He's not too comfortable on the land. Wow, Kevin, it says you took this photo. Is that true? I did take that photo, but I do not know what he is. I mean, he's some kind of grasshopper or locust from South Africa, and very colorful, and he's large, too. And did you do any research to find out what it is? I looked in books, but I couldn't. My, I'm not a very good etymol uh, entomologist. entomologist. So if any of you teachers out there can find this for us, uh, get back to us. Let us know what it is. Pablo says a Mardi Gras grasshopper. A Mardi Gras hopper. <laughs> Candy corn, candy corn grasshopper. Oh, I think Pablo's just making up names. Um, but mutant teenage great. grasshopper. Nice one, Andre. Oh, great activity for your students. What about if you show them these pictures and ask them to, to name these creatures? Ask them to make up a name for that. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so... Get curious, do more research, and finally, you guys are educators. Share. Share what you know. Yes, Tanya, I took that picture. Because who knows, maybe one of your students is going to be a ranger in a wildlife park. Or they might write a book on animals in the country. We have a thousand students that attend our webinar. Certainly, some of them or their students are going to write books. Could be about wildlife. Some of them might become presidents. So let's pass around this information. What is loop listening? Well, loop listening is when you have a very short text and you hear it again and again and again. And here's a very short text because I want you to bring something concrete into your lesson. And I think you can use this at all levels. You hear it again and again, so your students could just write down the words. You don't need to write them in the text box, but let's listen to this loop dictation. When you go to the store Refuse the bag Bring your own Recycle, reuse When you go to the store Refuse the bag Bring your own Recycle, reuse When you go to the store Refuse the bag Bring your own Recycle, reuse When you go to the store 
store. Refuse the bag. Bring your own. Recycle. Reunite. When you go to the store. Refuse the bag. Bring your own. Recycle. Reuse. Okay, you can download that a little song from the Ning, bring it into your classroom, and you've introduced uh, an environmental topic, opening students' awareness on recycling, and doing a language learning lesson. How cool is that? All right. So other ways you can get involved are coming up with a classroom calendar. Let's look at some real-life examples. World Elephant Day, looks like it'll be in August. Endangered Species Day in May. We just passed World Wildlife Day, but we have World Rhino Day coming up. You could probably do a Google search and find out what sort of things are relevant in your region of the world and have your students suggest things and perhaps they can even come up with their own calendar. Yeah. And it's fun to have students prepare for these days so they know on Rhino Day they can will have a drawing contest to see who can draw the best rhino. They might do some research. Hey, Maria Bolivia is telling us about Earth Hour on March 29. Well, let's go to the next slide because it's about Earth Hour. It's about Earth Hour. This is a really great idea to raise people's awareness of the environment for one hour on March 29th at 8.30 p.m. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. It's 8.30 everywhere. You turn off your lights for one hour. That's right. It's, it's a real powerful awareness building activity. I imagine it allows you to see the stars more and kind of get a sense of how many people are participating as well. Yeah, if you live on a, in a city and a lot of people are participating, it's really fun to look out the window and see the lights go off. Spread the news. Share. Let people know. It's a good idea. And it's this month. And it's this month. It's just two weeks from now. Yes, all activities will be available on our Ning or on AmericanEnglish.state.gov. All right, so let's sum things up. We're back to that elephant in the room. That elephant is, we all know that a lot of animal species are suffering, but we tend to ignore it. I think that we should share this knowledge and make our students aware of it. Let's talk about the issue. Let's talk about the issue, because everyone loves elephants. So this is something that our Secretary of State said just a few months back. We do not have the luxury of time. We must act urgently and raise public awareness. And this was directly about wildlife and the impact we have on wildlife. Yeah, especially elephants and ivory. If you don't buy ivory, no one will want to hurt an elephant. Wow, Kevin, what's going on with this? Are they hurting the rhinoceros? And why are they blindfolding him? Let's ask our participants, do you know what's happening to the rhino here? Horrible, what is happening? Horrible pick. No, 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 no. We don't want to leave you on a bad note. What are they actually doing, Kevin? Well, actually, they're not going to hurt the rhino. People that want a rhino horn, they just kill it and leave it on the ground. These people, this is a South African park people, they're moving a rhino from an area where it's in danger from poachers. Poachers are people who illegally hunt. They're moving it to a safe area where they can protect it. And they're blindfolding the rhino so that it doesn't get sick or dizzy or scared. 
Yeah, they're taking care of it, actually. But the question is, you don't have a helicopter. How can you help? Well, you don't need a helicopter to help the environment. You can make a difference. That's why I love this website that moderator Jenny pointed me to, because moderator Jenny used to live in this town in Costa Rica. Kids Saving the Rainforest. These kids developed this website and also a mechanism for helping monkeys in the rainforest by stringing ropes over bridge, uh, rope bridges they have increased the monkey population in their area so you can make a difference and your students can make a difference let's look at what Albert Einstein has said We've left the last word blank for you to think about. Learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. Ute knows this word. Uh, the important thing is to not stop. Okay, we, have, we see trying, living, learning, dreaming. Those are all great. Those are all great. Not stop giving up. That's good, too. Not stop thinking. Uh-huh. What did he actually say? Questioning. Yeah. yeah, when you ask questions, it's kind of like a gift. It is. I like this. If we think of a shark, let's ask questions. How do we really feel about the sharks? Do we know the reality? This is important for learning, to always keep asking ourselves questions. And we have one more very wise quote. So, you've probably heard of Kevin and Micah. Well, at least now you have. <laughs> so what's more important to you? That students learn the day's lesson or that they go home wanting to learn more? Pablo from Mexico says both. Yeah, that's right. But we'd probably give the emphasis on wanting to learn more because then we've given them the gift of learning on their own. Right. Because, once again, learning the lesson is sort of just filling the bucket, but wanting to learn more at home is lighting the fire, right? And I would rather have teachers light the fire than just give me the information. Oh, incidentally, We've already mentioned writing frames. I think this would be a cool writing frame. In your opinion, education is not blank, but blank. So I'm going to ask you, think about that, complete the sentence, and share it with us on the Ning. We're going to continue this discussion on the Ning. And if you'd like to contribute, uh, your own animal activities, that's great, too. And just to review very quickly, we hope you, we've made you more aware about wildlife. By sharing the activities that we think you can easily experiment with in your classroom. And we hope we've convinced you it's worth it to break into the syllabus with your own activities. And perhaps most important, that we've inspired you to bring your own passion to the classroom and to find out what the passions of your students are. Yep. So we hope to see an elephant in your lesson soon. That's me and Micah um, a few years ago. Yeah, I'm the little baby on the right, and Kevin's that handsome fellow on the left. Ah, that's right. And so thank you all for attending today. We love having you at our webinars. In two weeks, Relo Scott Chiverton will be giving the last webinar of 12.6. And now let's turn it over to moderator Jenny, and she will close things out.
Thanks so much, Kevin and Micah. I know that I am definitely a little more or maybe a lot more passionate about both the animals and environment than when I started, and I hope that all of you are too.